Hello and welcome to the Green Dream video series. I'm Natalie Kernway, Global Head of ESG Insights at ESG Clarity. Today I am delighted to be joined by the Chief Responsible Investment Officer at CPR Asset Management, Fred Samama. Thank you so much for joining me, Fred. My pleasure, Natalie. <laughs> So Fred has an extensive career in responsible investing. He started responsible investing at Monday 10 years ago and has published 15 books or papers on cl climate change. He is the founder of the SWF Research Initiative, co-editor of a book on long-term investing alongside Nobel Prize laureate Joseph Stiglitz and Professor Patrick Bolton, and most recently contributed to another of Patrick Bolton's books, The Green Swan, Central Bank and Financial Stability in the Age of Climate Change, which looks at the need for system change. Additionally, Fred in his career was responsible for developing low carbon indices at MSCI. That's quite impressive, Fred. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me today. So first of all, can you talk about the, um, the book, The Green Swan book? What were the key points that you contributed and why were these issues important to you? You're absolutely right. Uh, about uh, 18 months ago, um, uh, two central banks, the Banque de France, uh, the BIS, Columbia University, and myself, we released uh, the Green Swan. Um, we had in this book uh, three key messages about climate change. We said uh, that it's a unique risk due to um, three features that about climate change that are the fact that it's a risk that is certain. It's not a third risk. We know that climate change is coming. Second, very importantly, we said, when we talk about climate change, you have many forces like societal forces, like nature, like regulatory environments. And all these forces are interacting with each other and they have a lot of non-linearities. So interaction and non-linearities. It seems to be very technical, but it means something very profound. In that when you face such a situation, it's very complicated to have a model to establish the future. So you have to accept radical uncertainties. And so it's no more about thinking about the future and then taking action. It's about mm. taking action. And third message was that um, it threatens human life. And when it threatens human lives, it changes the priorities for policymakers. For memory, if we are on the wrong path on climate change, at the end of the century, it will not be possible to live on the planet for about four to five billion people. Yes, it will not be possible to live in South America, Central America, Africa, India, Indonesia, Australia, and so on. It's based on a paper published by Nature in 2017. So we said in this paper, when we talk about climate change, it's not like inflation, it's not like growth, it's not like all the risks that we usually face. Certain non-linearities threatening human lives on the planet. And what is quite incredible is that we published a book in January 2020. We had no idea about the COVID-19, but the COVID-19 is a green swan. It was certain, we don't know, but it was. A lot of non-linearities, suddenly a a Chinese virus triggers uh, an agreement between Russia and Saudi Arabia on the oil price. And third, it threatens human lives. And then policymakers are changing the rules of the game. And so basically we put on the table a new framework uh, to assess this very specific risk. But we didn't stop there. We say that when you, when you have that analysis, again, it means that there is not one silver, sing, um, silver bullet. All market participants must be part of the solution. It's a risk that is unhedgeable and you need to have more coordination. So we, we established some consequences based on that uh, analysis. And to conclude on, on your question, the book has been quite successful uh, because uh, so far it has been downloaded 
more than 115,000 times. And uh, for a book that is quite uh, technical, not to say boring, I can say it because I'm one of the others, uh, it's, uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite successful. And just uh, one year later, we organized the Green Swan Conference, so the follow-up of the Green Swan book, uh, co-organized uh, with the IMF, with the NGFS, the Network for Greening the Financial System, uh, the BIS, um, and, uh, and the Banque de France. And it was a very successful conference because we had uh, 15 uh, speakers, 20 workshops, and one of the panels included Jerome Powell, Christine Lagarde, and Yi Gang, the governor of the Central Bank of China, who for the first time ever all together spoke about climate change. Why do I mention that conference? Because it says a lot. It says that uh, now central banks have realized that climate change is threatening financial stability. And so it's part of their mandates. They are not shifting their objectives. They're recognizing like that like the COVID-19, it could impact uh, financial stability. Um, and, and they are looking for ways to reduce risks associated with climate change. So to conclude on your first question, over a very short period of time, um, the book, uh, the conference have helped shift the debate uh, at the highest possible level, meaning at the central bank's level. Some very scary statements there. Thank you, um, Frederick, for bringing that to our attention. But what part can central banks play from an environmental perspective in mitigating climate change? Well, we debated about that question for three days. So uh, it will be hard for me to summarize <laughs> in five minutes, uh, uh, 20 workshops uh, dedicated to your question. Uh, and, uh, and before I answer, what must be clear as well is that policymakers must take action for central banks. You know, the ones that are regulating polluting companies are not central banks, but policymakers. The, one that, the ones that can impose on auto car makers some new constraints on their cars are again, the policymakers. That said, what can central banks do? Uh, they can mobilize their human capital you know, they have a lot of talents, skills, and so on. They can help assess the risks associated with um, climate change. And maybe the, the, the biggest risk now uh, is about how to shift portfolios with carbon neutrality. Because here we are observing a fascinating moment now. Over the past six months, look, at the COP21, the world woke up, fantastic. But then, you know, all players went into their own directions. You had, um, you had uh, governments with NDCs, you had um, corporates with green bonds and so on. You know, everybody was exploring its own avenue. And over the past six months, we have observed something totally different and fascinating everyone converges on the same objectives. And so it's becoming the new normal. To give you some numbers, now you have 107, 113 countries representing 70% of the emissions that are committed to be carbon neutral. 113 countries. On the investor side, you have asset owners representing 6.6% trillion dollars. You have um, asset managers representing uh, $43 trillion. And you have banks representing $28 trillion. The sum of them makes about $80 trillion. $80 trillion. It also, some of them, are, we are comparing sometimes uh, oranges and apples, not so clear what are exactly the commitments. You know, even if you cut that number by two, by three, by 10, it's still $8 trillion, a huge amount. And then the question is, what does it mean to be carbon neutral? And here, although there is 
a huge commitment, the industry is still trying to figure out the right methodology. And during the conference, we disclosed a new one that has been developed within CPR uh, that say that is super simple. It says that we, we can be back to science. Science says to be carbon neutral, we have a budget for the planet, 420 gigaton of CO2 by 2050. G, uh, IPCC said so in 2017. And the, uh, the main idea is to say that what is true for the planet can be true for portfolios. And so we mimic the budget of the planet with the budget of equity and fixed income portfolios. And it works pretty well. We are already implementing that. But what we have discovered as well by developing the solution, that also it's totally feasible now and with limited impacts on portfolios, the situation shifts very quickly with time because the budget shrinks. And with that fact, it's becoming increasingly complicated with time. And so here we face a new situation for all market participants. On the one hand, you have massive amounts of money being committed to align portfolios with a one and a half degree objective. On the other hand, the path is extremely narrow. So you have a major execution risk. We also look at the social elements at ESG Clarity. Um, central bank action is often talked about in the context of widening the wealth gap. Can you talk a bit about that and how this can be addressed by social impact investors? We had a, a very um, um, a clear case study, I would say, um, uh, about uh, one year ago with the Fed. The Fed cannot be uh, accused of um, being um, on the left side of the, of the spectrum. Let's put that this way. And, uh, and over the summer last year, Jerome Powell uh, made very strong statements. He said, we at the Fed, we have a problem. We don't have inflation enough. And, and why is that a problem? Because you, when you don't have inflation, you cannot monitor uh, the, the, the growth level of the, of the economy. You don't have the tools. And he said, how can we have more inflation? It was one year ago. Uh, by having more people at work. And why don't we have full capacity in terms of employment? And he said, because we are not. And he said, very particularly, we are not because we don't have he said it this way, black and Spanish people at work in the US. And he said, why? Due to a lack of education. And suddenly the Fed, who had never talked about education, but that topic as one of the uh, key elements to uh, monitor in the United States and more than monitor to improve. And so suddenly a topic that was really um, more on the, on the progressive agenda shifted mainstream uh, with uh, a key message from the Fed. And now that leads to your question, how is that related to impact investing? I think that before answering the question is, to your question is, what is impact investing? And at CPR, we say something very simple. We say that corporates are evolving into an environment. You know, a couple of decades ago, when Paul Volcker decided to cut inflation, it impacted corporates. Or when globalization started, uh, it impacted corporates. So corporates are evolving into an environment. And some of them are impacted. Some of them are benefiting from that environment through their activity. And here we can say that the environment is a lot about climate change and is about as well inequalities because uh, the level of education in the US is about uh, inequalities. And so 
investors that are choosing corporates that are aligned through their activity with these two forces can benefit from these positive forces behind the corporates that um, uh, is uh, supposed to deliver some uh, uh, positive uh, impacts on society and positive impacts on returns as well. When you align with the trends, you're helping the trend and you're benefiting from that uh, support. It's slightly different from ESG. ESG is about how the corporate is managed. Mm -hmm. Here it's about what is the activity of the corporate. Concrete example, Tesla sometimes doesn't have a good ESG rating. We all know why. But the activity of the corporate is fully aligned with this trend on climate change. At the opposite, some coal companies have very good ESG ratings sometimes, but they are not aligned with this trend on climate change. And so either it's about the internal organization of the corporate, or it's about the activity of the corporate. And, mm -hmm. and when the forces and the question becomes what is more important, it all depends on the forces. When the societal forces are limited, ESG matters. When the societal forces are very strong, then it's more about impact investing. And at CPR, we have developed funds on education, on climate change, on foods for generations, on cities. You know, all these funds are trying to capture these societal forces. Again, for the benefit of society and for the benefit of the industry. How can portfolios be aligned with the one and a half degree objective? What else are you doing at CPR Asset Management? It's a good question because, um, so what we've done is that we, um, we have uh, mimicked uh, the budget of the planet as established by the IPCC. So uh, 420 gigaton of CO2 starting in 2018. And what we have said is that that budget that works for the planet can be used for uh, equity portfolios, fixing code portfolios and so on. So very concretely, uh, on the climate action, that is an up and running fund that we have, that represents globally in terms of strategy, $1.5 billion. What we do is that we say to the portfolio manager, on a yearly basis, here is your carbon budget for the year. So you have a constraint, you cannot spend more than X, Y, Z. And the budget evolves year after year. And the sum of all the budgets will be the equivalent of what works for the planet. And, uh, and so it's a fund that is, um, I would say pretty cool because it combines a CDP analysis to identify the corporate that are well aligned with um, climate change, uh, CPR capabilities in terms of um, uh, financial analysis. Then we add this carbon uh, neutrality um, objective and Although it was not required, we had we have added uh, a carbon offsetting mechanism uh, top of it. So it's a very very green fund uh, with CDP uh, involved with um, this carbon neutrality constraint being added to um, the portfolio construction, and top of it carbon offsetting. We always finish the green dream with this question: What is your favorite sustainable drink or snack? Well, I mean, green tea. <laughs> How could it be different? <laughs> you know what? It's very true. <laughs> I drink a lot of green tea. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for sharing your insights with us. It's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you.